Let's stay on the topic of uh, the ridiculous, and let's go to the review of this week's episode of Dark Side of the Ring. I must admit, I enjoyed this for perverse reasons, this episode. Oh the story of, I guess, not just Marcus Bagwell or Buff Bagwell, but Buff and the Bagwells, the entire Bagwell clan. Yeah, and hold on, I'm I'm zipping through my notepad. I've got it, I wanted to make sure I was accurately reporting some of these things. So yes, and, and we talked to Evan Husney here last week, I guess, or went on the experience, where one of these programs, it's probably out by now, um, about the entire season, and he mentioned that there were some over-the-top stories of about, I've obviously met Mark Bagwell uh, in in the past. I've never spent any significant time in the same place or, you know, working with him or, you know, whatever to any extent. So, you know, I had no preconceived notion otherwise than what I've heard that he's over the last 20 years always been in some kind of fucking issue or other. But I had no idea about most of the things that were in this episode, even how he got into business. Uh, to be honest, in, in many cases, I've, I'd never been curious enough to seek this information out. But I re the, <laughs> I've been cognizant of him since I guess this was his first spot because Joe Petticino, when he was doing, thought he was going to be doing global wrestling with the the backing of the Nigerian millionaire. And we've told that story here on the program. I don't want to sidetrack it, but Bagwell had gotten started in Georgia. Petticino's in Georgia. Now to Petticino obviously knew Missy Hyatt. And he became the handsome stranger. And this is one of the things I remember asking Petticino, are you, are you out of your mind? Because the deal was Bagwell. Nobody knew who he was because he had just started, but he was a great looking guy. But he was dressed up in like a Lone Ranger mask and like a, I think he had a, like a jacket and hat that kind of looked like Rudolph Valentino shit. And Petticino, do you know about the, the bouquet of roses, Brian? I mean, I remember the handsome stranger. Yeah, but the he started out, Petticino had him coming out with a bouquet of roses and walking around the ring and presenting the roses to the fucking, some lucky recipient young lady at ringside who then apparently Petticino thought would just swoon or whatever. And I mean, think about the crowds that Joe was drawing at that point in the sportatorium. There were no, sometimes he had to look for a grandmother or something. But it was just, I said, what are you, oh, this kid's going to be, you know, he's going to be great. And, you know, that's how I became cognizant of him. And then, you know, I saw off and on the various transformations in WCW. But I, I, I had no idea that his family was as bizarre as, as they are and were. And, you know, if the people didn't see the episode, his father was apparently a race car driver and a self-made millionaire who owned a lumber company with 250 employees and had a big family living in a big house and somehow managed to fucking blow it all. And they went broke and lost all their money. Now, <clears throat> I don't know whether it was because uh, <laughs> Basically, Brian, this is probably a more Southern story than it is a Northern story. But this is the classic example of the honey boo-boo syndrome. When you get some rednecks from down South that get a lot of money, shit happens. I've, I've seen and or, you know, been around a number of these, and you see them down here. I don't know if they have this phenomenon <laughs> up in New Jersey. But, I mean, the father lost a poker game in his house one time, so he grabs a machine gun, which he just happens to have in his fucking house, and goes out to the lake they live in front of and mows down a herd of fucking geese. Or when Buff and his friends, well, he wasn't Buff then, but Bag Marcus and his friends are going to go out on the town, he comes in and throws them 
bags of cocaine and said, now don't get in trouble now, boys, have fun. And Bagwell's like, well, at least he knew it was clean stuff. He knew where he got it. What the fuck? Uh, and and Judy's the one running the lumber yard, and everybody's putting her over as, you know, the, she's the one everybody yeah. was scared of. She ran everything. Fucking Danny she Hodge. Did every, yeah, you're yeah she's, her over. Well, she's Danny Hodge and fucking John Gotti at the same time. Don't <laughs> cross this, this lady. What the fuck? She married this fucking guy, the race car driver that fucking lost all his money and used machine guns on geese. And and the pic the old pictures, he looks like a normal fat redneck from down south, but as he's sitting there as a talking head, it looks like somebody set his face on fire and put it out with an axe. Did he have some kind of accident slash reconstructive fucking surgery, or is it just that he's a not aged well? Uh, but uh, so shockingly, the family finds out that they're in financial trouble and they're going broke. And that begins trouble with Judy and dad and Judy then decides she's going to leave one time and dad won't let her. And apparently from what Marcus says, dad is beating Judy. So Marcus comes out and stops him with a gun said, I'll shoot you. You wouldn't shoot me. I'm your, well, don't make me. So his father goes, it being the voice of reason in the family goes and gets the gun that he's hidden on top of the refrigerator. And before he can shoot Marcus, Marcus shoots him. What the fuck? If why are these people telling these fucking stories? This is a television program, not a goddamn therapy session. You were right. It sounds like a Southern thing to me. Oh, I'm telling you, this is a Southern family. <laughs> it is a Southern family. I guarantee you they've got the stars and bars out front. They're voting fucking strictly for Trump. And they're goddamn... <sighs> You know what story they didn't tell in here? And I always think about it. There was probably no way to include it because it wouldn't have fit. But one of the first stories I ever heard about Marcus Bagwell was that while living in the same complex as Missy before he was in the business, like Eddie Gilbert showed up in the night or something. Uh, again, Missy's out there. I don't want to say a story that isn't exactly true. But this, the rumor was Eddie Gilbert showed up either trying to win Missy back or trying to catch Missy with someone, whatever it was. And he encountered a young, not fucked up, really buff Marcus Bagwell. <laughs> like, what the fuck are you doing? And that was the first time he met Bagwell before he was even in the business, when Eddie tried to get into Missy's apartment. I, I can believe that because we find out that it, living in the same apartment complex, he meets Missy, who says, well, you ever decide to be a wrestler? And he's, he's already working as a male stripper since his family has now gone broke. And he's married this poor girl named Tanya. They're both like 18 years old. And somehow he convinces Tanya to become the, the stripper so that he can go to wrestling school. And after he gets his first contract, quote unquote, then he'll take care of her. But now, did you see, is Steve the brawler lawler? What did they do there? Because they showed a picture of Steve Kyle from 1972 when he was working as Steve Lawler. Looked like, but a, there was, looked like a little Al Vavasor photo. Yes, I guess. but there was another guy who worked as Steve the Brawler Lawler in Georgia Independence, was it? Or was that Steve Kyle on his way out? Because I thought he was done long before that. See, I mean, he said he was trained by Steve Lawler, not that he was working with Steve yes, Lawler. Yes, no, he said he was trained by... But my question is, was I didn't know Steve Kyle was around the wrestling business in 19 fucking... What was that, 89 or 90? 90, 91, I would say. Okay, yeah, he... Where'd he go for fucking... And Remember there was another fake Lawler, Gary Lawler? Well, there was a Gary Lawler, and I think he was from Southern Indiana. But I, yeah. th I think there may have even been somebody help me down in Georgia. Was Steve the Brawler Lawler that trained Marcus Bagwell, Steve Kyle? But anyway, nevertheless. So then Missy gives the videotape of him as the handsome stranger to Jim Barnett. Oh my boy! And here we and. <sighs> Again, that was fairly quick, so 
he spent almost his entire career as a wrestler of any note whatsoever in WCW, start to finish, which is is unusual for almost anybody, right? But uh, but uh, you know, if t- tag teaming with Two Cold Scorpio and uh, then Scotty Riggs, the uh, the American males, they one cheesy gimmick after another, but they. He he I guess he was so good looking they figured well he's got to do something sometime. But of course when he becomes a star he cheats on Tanya and broke up with her cuz she couldn't forgive him for it. And what about the calf implant store? Oh that's another thing. Slick Johnson. Yeah. I forgot to mention. He stole the show in this thing. Well yes cuz he's hilarious. He is a hilarious motherfucker. He was friends with Jeff Jarrett and was refereeing for TNA when I first got there and yes, he's a hilarious fucking guy and not afraid to tell a fucking story apparently that may cast people in a negative light. But, uh, God damn when Bagwell got calf implants cause his calves wouldn't get big enough and his body rejected him. He nearly died. He needed to have him taken out and need to be carried to the toilet on Slick's back for two weeks because he couldn't fucking walk. You know what? That's not even the most ridiculous moment with him. I questioned, I think, last review. What are they going to do? A reenactment of someone stubbing their toe? They've taken it to a whole new level. The story <laughs> from Slick Johnson and then the reenactment of Judy Bagwell shaving Marcus Bagwell's balls. Yes, that that I thought was was one of the finer reenactment reenactments reenactments <laughs> because you you felt like you were right there. Apparently, Slick Johnson comes in one day, and because when Bagwell actually finally gets a fucking contract where he's making some legitimate amount of money out of WCW, he hires his whole redneck dysfunctional fucking family and pays them salaries to go to the laundry for him or do the shopping or whatever and includes slick walks in and there's bagwell bent over buck naked and judy his mother is shaving his balls and they're just hi hey slick how you doing i i I couldn't even imagine asking ma excuse me if you don't mind, I, if you're not yeah, doing yeah. anything. <laughs> you know, I, my shoulder's bad. I can't reach back. I thought it was bad when fucking, what is fat mama's name on Honey Boo Boo when she took her shoe off and showed everybody she had fucking gnats flying under the pus in her infected toenail. Oh. This is a, oh. yeah, but I'm telling you, rednecks it's with It's a southern money. thing. It's a southern thing. It's a southern thing. So, and by the way, Eric Bischoff, Marcus Alexander Bagwell, Scotty Riggs. It looked like John Davidson and fucking George Michael had babies back in the day. All the hair, all the tan, all the smiles, all the buff. They look like shit now. I would like to register again that I'm in the best shape of my life and I weigh 187 pounds. And I've got, I have not had to resort to shaving my head. I got most all of my teeth, and the ones that show are still here. Well, for the record, I think Scotty Riggs had a rough time, he said, in the thing. He's had a rough Well, he's, he's all right now, but last week he's in rough shape. I don't care. I'm just saying, God damn it. <laughs> God damn it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live till every single one of these good-looking, handsome, sexy motherfuckers rots away and, and fucking looks like they got leprosy. And I'm going to look the same as I always have. And and when you look the same as you always have, you start out looking like shit, and it improves from there because you've lowered expectations. You really think Bischoff looks that awful? He just looks like Bischoff, like an older Bischoff. Well, he just... shaved his fucking head because he's all gray. Well, he's always embraced the gray. Maybe he, he looks a little paunchy. <laughs> well, he likes the wine. Maybe he's been drinking some. He embrace the gray, but you know you embrace it when you have it. Well, I've still got quite a bit of color. It's salt and peppery. Pepper may be a little weaker than it once was. And again, well, let me just point out, Scotty Riggs, Scott, uh, I think I saw him maybe work for Smoky Mountain Wrestling uh, when I was down there. Uh, but he was, he had a rough go. Not fair to. Well, he he was, he was. Um, I don't know if he had teeth in this interview. Well, I'm not sure. 
but uh, he was uh, he was coming up with Jake the Snake at that point. Remember, Scotty was Scotty was Jake's assistant when he got the twenty five grand in cash in Mexico for shaving his head, and Scotty strapped it to his body and locked himself in in their rental car until. Jake got shaved, and then they drove to the airport where they could sit there all night in front of witnesses so nobody could fucking jump them. Anyway, so, finally, Bagwell joins the NWO. Oh, after he's married his second wife, Erica, and his third wife, Judy, before he's 30 years old, uh, he joins the NWO, and now he, the quote from Bagwell is, I have made it. And... You know, he that's when his mother opens a corporation for him and Mark hires the whole family and he acts in some cheap movies and, you know, he thinks it, it's going to be great. And then I I knew he had had a neck injury. I never saw the footage in, until, uh, as far as I remember, until this. And now you see, this was the same kind of injury that Tommy Young had, only instead of, hitting head first against somebody's back. He hit head first against the ring rope, but the same principle, it jammed his neck backwards when Steiner went over the top of him on the bulldog and he went out down and, and head butted him. And again, what was he off for like a year and he had surgery and plates put in his neck and blah, blah, blah. How many times a week, on television now, do we see guys taking way more fucking brutal bumps than that, and somehow, by miraculous divine intervention, they get up and continue on, and it's only a matter of time? It's only a matter of time. That's the sad thing. Because you to play that in slow motion, it was like, eh. If you know what that can do to someone, then you would say, oh, shit. But otherwise, for a wrestling bump, that was meh. And anyway, so he's off for a year and then somehow that's what they got Judy involved on TV. She's pushing his wheelchair, it, it, blah, blah, blah. And even Bischoff says, well, we probably went to the well too often with Judy Bagwell. But my God, what? I mean, do they forget? They acted like it was a good deal at first. Do they forget that everybody was laughing at him from the first moment that she appeared on screen and it was part of the days of shit stain who was not mentioned in this. Obviously he's not pertinent to anything, but it was part of what the people were mocking WCW for. They, they glossed over that part. You know, they try to justify, I say they, sometimes people try to justify things that were really bad in the past by pretending they were good. Well, I guess they're making the Bagwell family look bad enough <laughs> in this Show anyway, we don't need to tell the truth about Judy, all of that. Judy Bagwell on a pole. Yeah. But anyway, and then and I had how much how much of the detail had you heard before about uh, uh Marcus Bagwell and Shane Helms getting in an argument slash fight slash felonious assault, pick your version of the story that was told here by Bagwell himself. You know, I must admit, partially because in general, I, I, I kind of don't care about some of these people. I never really heard too much about the story. I'd heard that he had worked at First Raw and was fired, but I heard it was for, you know, him kind of being himself. At least that's the way it was put to me. And then his mom called Jim Ross and you know, all that. <laughs> they didn't even mention that, I don't think, in this. Well, it, him being himself, what I had heard was that people were not thrilled with his attitude he was being himself and then they had the match that night with he and booker t and you know i didn't have details otherwise now i've never asked shane helms because his, his name wasn't mentioned to me as being a part of it but i think that what probably part of him being himself and they didn't like his attitude was was i believe he got in an argument with shane helms uh, Hurricane Helms, our friend Hurricane, uh, uh, earlier in the day before television, he talked about they were at a workout session. I guess that's what he's referring to, getting to TV early and running through shit, right? That's because you're 
you're dealing with Bagwell, who only worked in one company before he began his downward descent into drugs and madness. So therefore, as we'll find out in a few minutes, he's actually never been smartened up to the actual business. We'll find that out in a second. But see, I never knew all this shit. Um, his story is that if they were at a workout session training session or whatever, he, however he termed it. I forgot to write down the exact words. And Shane Helms was a smart ass to him, said something about, oh, Bagwell's got to show up on time now because Helms had worked in WCW with Bagwell. And Bagwell was already, it had already been mentioned that when he came back from his neck injury, he had quote unquote turned to drugs or possibly turned more to drugs. And so I can believe that Shane Helms said, ah, you know, because now Bagwell's in a whole new atmosphere. He's got to actually show up on time instead of being fucked up or whatever. And wh I can believe that they had an argument and Bagwell had a bad attitude. What I don't know that I believe is Bagwell's story that he said, well, I gave him what, what my daddy taught me called the Bagwell slap. It's just to a, just a express dominance where he says he slapped Shane Helms, who in the reenactment of this went down. All right. And then... The famous Bagwell slap. The famous Bagwell slap enraged Hurricane Helms so badly, according to Marcus Bagwell, that Bagwell says that as he turned around to walk away victorious with this one slap knockout, Shane Helms, and they show this in the reenactment, goes under his shirt in the corner of the ring and gets a water bottle. Brian, I swear to God, water bottles have still been plastic since 2001, right? They were, they were still plastic in 2001, were they not? I believe so, yes. Okay, and also they're in a ring working shit out, but this water bottle was frozen. It was a solid block of ice. Because... Bagwell says that Shane came from behind out of nowhere with a frozen ice bottle. That was the quote and hit him over the head and the reenactment of shit was breaking everywhere. And then Bagwell says, I didn't tell anybody. You didn't tell anybody that somebody clocked you over the head with a fucking bottle in the middle of the ring in a goddamn arena before a TV taping. And left blood everywhere, and there was no one else there. And you guys were working yes, out in the and ring. He, and he said, I looked down, I saw all this blood that nobody else saw, and you were completely alone in this fucking arena. And, and wasn't it Spokane, Washington? It was either Seattle or Spokane that this, uh, this match happened. So he says, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't put it over. I went to my own doctor. Marcus Bagwell has a goddamn doctor in Spokane, Washington. In the middle of the day, in between workout and TV. In the middle TV. of the day, I'm, hey, uh, Chief Strongbow, I'm going to fucking run out for a little while to get 25 staples put in my head. I'll be right back. He says he put 25 staples in his head, and what he did was he colored it with a Sharpie so you couldn't see the staples. And he wrestled Booker T that night. That was a quote from Bagwell, and I had a match that night with Booker T. And then said everybody started knocking their match. Like, it was so, so what if it was a bad match? And then they have a clip of the fans, this match sucks, this match sucks. Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, because you're the historian here, and I'm just a small-town bird lawyer. But was the conventional wisdom that was pretty much the story and accepted by everybody, not disputed by really anybody that I remember, of any major consequence that they were going to do some kind of WCW WWE or F at the time, if it was fucking deal. Cause Vince had bought the thing, but they put Booker T and buff Bagwell out in somewhere in Washington state where WCW was not exactly a, a ratings powerhouse at that point. And Bagwell was just being Bagwell and prob possibly fucked up because he did that by his own admission in those days, or possibly he just wasn't very fucking good. And they had a shitty match because that's the thing. Bagwell got by with being Bagwell in WCW. It's kind of like 
uh, Mark Merrow, Johnny B. Bad. Mm. And everybody knocked it because it sucked, and Vince got mad and said, fuck it, and cut the whole deal off. Is that not the way that it happened? The way that I remember it was the fans shit all over the match in the building. The match wasn't specifically great. It did hurt at the fact that this is happening and none of the big stars from WCW, not to take away anything from Booker T and even Bagwell, they were stars there. Booker T had been elevated, but it wasn't Goldberg, Flair, the NWO or Luger or any of those guys, you know, Sting. Booker T Booker T was not then who Booker T would become later. And Bagwell was pretty much who Bagwell would always be from then on. And the story always was that Vince McMahon saw the reaction live in the room that night where those fans shit all over this match and said, forget it, we're not doing anything where WCW... We're not going to do the invasion the right way, basically. And 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 to be fair to these guys, if they had it in Atlanta, the people would have been more forgiving. If they had it in North Carolina, or they had it in some WCW stronghold. Potentially Chicago might have been neutral. But it, it wouldn't have... It wouldn't have stunk, uh, but it still wouldn't have torn the building down, if, even if they had it in the Tokyo Dome. But that's the way Vince is. He painted... Ah, them those fucking guys with the whole br and ignored the facts that he was in a place that didn't know them. And this was not the upper echelon of the WCW roster. And it was just not the proper presentation because he wanted it to be a self-fulfilling prophecy because he didn't really want to put those guys over. And the one and he had that, Kevin Dunn also in his ear saying, "See, you see, look yeah, at how they yeah, all react." Yeah, yeah, see, and nobody knows these guys, and 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 they're not they're not capable of doing what what your guys do, Vince. Here, let me put my elbow in your lap and and get a little blood in your peenie when I say that. So you know, but that's what happened, and at that point they called him up. But he, I believe once again, I believe there were, he had an attitude problem. He and Helms may have gotten an argument. I have a feeling that if he had actually just hauled off and slapped Shane Helms, that we would have heard about a fist fight that if one would think, unless there was a gag order that rivals who killed Kennedy for once in a wrestling arena while his shit was going on before a taping. But, um, but anyway, Bagwell was astonished. I got fired over a bad match. What the fuck? It was a bad attitude. He was catered to in WCW, especially the few years previous. And WWF didn't, as we talked about with it, many guys, not just him. They didn't give a shit. He was in deep talent water already, and he didn't stand out. But the Bagwell's quote here was, I was going to be one of the biggest names in pro wrestling ever. That's the problem. He legitimately believed that. And that's, you can't, you can't come into the biggest company in the world with the attitude that you are a huge star unless you've been a huge star. And he wasn't even a huge star in the, the second biggest company. He was one of the guys in the group and he couldn't hang at that point in the ring with the WWF upper echelon. Middle of the card, that might have been great, but he had a bad attitude. So he's been in the one big promotion for his entire career, and he made contract money for even a hundred grand a year was what they started in the early nineties. But he, I'm sure he was making to hire Judy and Dad and the whole hee haw gang. You know, we know what the guys were making in WCW the last few years, the NWO, whatever. But now he's 31 years old. And immediately he turns to drugs because he's out of work and depressed and broke. Apparently because he's not saved any money because he had three fucking wives. He had a career where for probably nine out of the first 10 years of his career, he had guaranteed money making in the six figures from low to middle and who knows what. And suddenly, instead of just saying, I'll go to Hawaii and fucking relax for six months, He's desperate and turns to fucking drugs and wrestles indies for the next 10 years before finally having the withdrawal seizure at the wheel of his car where he crashes his car and nearly kills himself. But after he recovers, he has no money, so he takes 25 grand to appear on a on Gigolo's TV show where he says he was only going in as a coach and didn't tell his third wife, who, they all love him. 
All of his ex-wives, apparently, yeah, we love him. We just got, you know, what a fuck up. I mean, I mean what the fuck? He, he goes in thinking he's going to be a coach to the other gigolos, and then he finds out that it was almost soft porn. But he was so upset about it, Brian. It was almost soft porn, but with insertion. <laughs> well, but then, then he's... <laughs> He claims to his ex-wife that he couldn't insert because he was, uh, you know, nervous about the whole thing. But the the producer after told him, oh, you're not supposed to really fuck him. And what the, f but he was so upset about it. He took up that line of work and began working for Cowboys for Angels as the, the male escort. But in, in, in a shocking turn of events, his first client falls in love with him. So he started to spend one week there and then the next week home with his wife. And then he leaves his wife for the client. Some fucking old lady who knows what they didn't reenact that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and his ex is saying, yeah, yeah, he just, you know, we, and he's that's, saying, Mark. Oh, that's Mark. That's Mark. That's <laughs> Mark. And he said, well, my wife got a job where she was never home. So, so he went into the arms of this fucking middle-aged, lonely whore paying him to fuck her. What the fuck is going on here? So then, <laughs> but, then but then they said, well, they said, well, asked the ex, what, ex-wife number three said, is he still with this? Well, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, that didn't last. So he ran off this wife that still, for some reason, likes this fucking loser piece of shit that he's been apparently his whole life. I never knew any of this shit. <laughs> and as some reason she still likes him, but he dumped her for some fucking middle-aged woman that was paying him to. So then they showed home security camera footage. And this was legitimate. This was not a reenactment. I'm not putting that in quotation marks, home security camera footage of Bagwell in his tiny, cluttered living room somewhere at some point in the 2000s teens. And I have a question. It looks like he's living in a trailer, but yet he's got a security camera, but it's pointed inside his house. What the fuck? Is he keeping an eye on himself? But it's it shows him stand up out of his chair, walk into a wall, bang his head, fall back into the recliner, and the recliner turn over backwards with him. Cut and scene. I don't think he's that good a goddamn actor to have staged that. Yeah, it is weird, the fact they had the security camera pointed into the living room. Uh, well, I'm wondering if maybe It was like somebody, Mr. Leahy on Trailer Park Boys. Is, is it somebody... I, I wish I got that, but... Me too. Is it? Me is too. it somehow the family wanted to keep an eye on him to make sure that he was still breathing or something? One of these times? I don't know. So they go the through the montage of he has car wrecks and arrests and fucking all of the we've talked about it. I think he was he was one of the ones that was doing cameos at first when he was all fucked up and uh, so whatever. And then and unfortunately his mother gets sick and passes away. And then apparently they said his niece took him in but made him clean up you know, on the theory that she would take him in. So I guess, was he living with his mother at that point and couldn't take care of himself, but she makes him clean up and he goes to visit <laughs> Diamond Dallas Page and reunites with Scotty Riggs, who was apparently sleeping in his car. What, what is it about Bagwell's goddamn social circle? His fucking, he shoots his father. His, his, his parents lose all their fucking money. His ex-tag team partner is sleeping in his fucking car. So they're all at Dallas. Pa Dallas Page must have the patience of a saint. Can the amount of... Of free publicity. What, but no, but... What, let me ask you a question, Brian. As one grown adult, and I ask everybody out there in the cult of Cornette, as one grown adult to many... How much money could it possibly be worth to take in over and over drunken, drug-addicted fucking pains in the ass and attempt to reform them? 
How far does human compassion go? If you've got that much, get in the goddamn line of work of, of helping sick and crippled children. Is crippled a bad word these days? Handicapped, handicapable, whatever you're supposed to say. Help small children, maybe homeless animals, but drunken fucking pillheads that have fucked their own lives up on numerous occasions despite what everybody else has asked them to do. How the fuck, how many can he take in? I would have cut my fucking throat after three days of the first one. I'm just being honest. Is anybody going to goddamn be mad at me for being honest? Who out there among you would take these motherfuckers into your homes without counting the silverware and, and still have a life worth living? What the fuck? As you said, he's obviously a very patient man. Patient man. So everybody puts uh, Marcus over as a person, and that was the end of that show. But gee, many Christ on a cracker. What, what is wrong with these people? Why would any of the people that sat down, and I'm, I, well, I can understand Slick Johnson or, you know, the people telling the stories about, but why would anybody in this family or that sat down to tell these things admit to these things? Even the ex-wives who were like, yeah, I still, still care about him. He fucked you around in ridiculous ways. He was a prick and an idiot, and a fucking egomaniac, and a goddamn drug addict, and a drunk, and a cheater, and a male whore. But we love him. So I guess the point is, if you're a single man, go move there. Go move there. And he, he blew numerous opportunities at numerous things, which apparently is a pattern of his family, who blew numerous opportunities. This fucking redneck old caved in faced father was a self-made multimillionaire that had a lumber yard that employed 250 people. And they end up broke on a fucking street. So well, it wasn't 250 million people. I said 250 people. Oh, I heard two. Did I say to Did I say 250 million? 250 million. A self-made, a self-made millionaire that employed 250 million people. Well, a million was on my mind. All right, well, that was the uh, Buff Bagwell story. Quite Jesus enjoyable. Right. Thanks, Missy, for getting this fucking guy into business. And he even, he even said he was surprised that he didn't kill somebody numerous times when he was in the process of running his car into various shit and almost killing himself. So <laughs> Missy did us all a favor. Once again, the question that we asked last time, is this really the dark side of the ring or is this just Wednesday in Georgia? I think this is, I can't say it's unheard of in Georgia, but it's definitely in the upper percentile when you take in everything as a whole. All right, well, uh, maybe <laughs> Judy, maybe Judy Badwell will shave that hole for you. I was about to say, apparently a lot of things have been taken in these holes in this program. Well, Jim, perhaps someone watched this episode of Dark Side and they said, ew, and they wanted to call someone up and spread the uh, disgust. You probably need a good you probably need a good phone plan. <laughs> you probably need a good plan for a good segue. I'll tell you if you want to get on the telephone and call somebody about uh one of the new nominees to the Hall of Fame or anything like that, you can't get on your telephone and call somebody unless you got a phone plan that you can rely on and that you can afford. Brian, I think those are Two things that we can all agree on. You got to be able to rely on something. You got to be able to afford it. Well, Mint Mobile has got both. Not only have they got the nation's largest 5G network, there are, there are 5,000 of these networks, and they've got the biggest. Five grand, right? 5G. The big well, five. Well, it's not grand. It's five gigs, I guess. Well, I'm not too grand then. But they got the nation's largest one, it's the biggest one. It is a big blue vein throbber of a 5G network. And folks, sounds great. That, that makes it, well, exactly. That makes it come with unlimited talk and text and high speed data. Now, I know you talk on a phone. I know you text on a phone. I'm not sure what kind of data the phone needs. Maybe some way to get you out of jail or crucial information you might need to exist in your daily life. But Mint Mobile's going to give it to you for 15 bucks a month because they're cheap that way. And here's why. Here's exactly how they do it. 
they let all these other big companies build all these big towers and charge all these big amounts of money for these same phone plan. And then the people at Mint Mobile, they take a big old spool of coax cable and they run it from one of these big towers to the other, but down low where nobody no, notices it. That's not what And that's what your phone calls are running through. And No, that is not doing. what your phone calls are running through. They do not use coaxial cable like it's 1986 to steal. They're not stealing anything. They do not use any yeah, cables. Yeah, well, now you're changing your story. I'm not changing my story. I'm modifying my if story they don't as use we're the going. Coax, if they don't use the coax to steal the service, then what do they use to steal the service? This is not that story. This is the revised edition. What I'm saying is that they use the signals in the air, and they hop on those signals. And either yes. way, you don't have to worry about any of this. You have to worry about the wonderful price that you're not going to have to worry about. You're just going to have to pay to get this wonderful service. What's so confusing about that? Well, apparently you seem to be all turned around about it, but I'll tell you what, while you're hopping on these signals in the air, piggybacking on them, don't be dragging your feet because they're going to be going from place to place that quick because Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or a family. And at Mint Mobile, families start at two lines, so apparently you can immaculately conceive. Just you and then you can have a baby and there's two lines. The family... so. Be be aware if you get Mint Mobile, you may spontaneously impregnate yourself. You However, won't do that. You won't do that. However, that's a funny thing to think about. However, well, you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan, and and help keep and that you can keep your same phone number, along with all of your existing contacts, whoever they may be, uh, your drug dealers, your your enforcers, your muscle men, the the collectors that go out and. You know, do your bidding. Whoever your existing contacts are and whatever kind of codes you've got for them, you can keep all of that. And you can choose from three-month plans, six-month plans, or 12-month plans and say goodbye to your monthly phone bill and say hello to a bill every three months or six months or 12 months, which apparently would be what then would be happening. But nevertheless, you can get, did I mention $15 a month, Brian? And you can get the plan shipped to your door for free. They got a guy named Ethel. You know what? why they call him? Well, you know why they call him Ethel? I do not know. No, I don't either. Because I meant to say a girl named Ethel. They got a girl <laughs> named Ethel that sits there and writes this plan out every time you order. That's how they keep the cost down. He, she writes out the plan every time you, and she puts a stamp on it and sends it right out to you, and it's free. That's not how it works, but uh, it's sort of a Don LaPre deal. It's not but, in any way like a Don LaPrey deal. Let's stress that. Well, you can, again, 15 bucks a month. You got to expect some, you know, changes from a normal operation here. But if you go to mintmobile.com slash JCE right now, then you can start up and sign up and start up at 15 bucks a month. That's right. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions may apply depending on where it is you live and what kind of people are running your state. But nevertheless, once again, mintmobile.com slash JCE, a wireless plan with unlimited talk and text and high-speed data on the nation's largest blue vein throbbing network, all for only $15 a month. It's, it's amazing. It's incredible. I don't even think anybody can talk that much to get their money's worth out of this, for heaven's sake. In the unlimited part, you got to talk all day and all night, talk all day, talk a little longer. Sounds like a wonderful challenge the listener should take up. $15 a month, see how much talking you can do with Mint Mobile. What's that promo code, Jim? Slash J-C-E.